Here. There's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Welcome back to Transform. We hope you enjoyed day one and got the chance to explore the environment, the network with fellow attendees, and I'm really excited today to share our expert panel and connect you with these industry experts and leaders to share their perspective on priorities for IT teams in 2021, um, as well as really performance monitoring for IT and the power, and this is important, the power of business observability. So I'm Steve Long. Um, I'm a current Cisco and AppD employee for the past three years. And if I go back about a decade ago, I became an AppD customer for the first time, and again in 2013 as the CIO of a FinTech company. So I've pretty much been a customer of Cisco and AppDynamics for a very long time. And I'm really excited today to introduce our honored guests, which is Stephen Elliott of IDC, and our two wonderful customers, which is Chris Younger of Freedom Financial, as well as Eric Smith of Aristocrats. Before we jump in, uh, Stephen, can you tell everybody about who you are and what your role is and what your company does? Sure. Thanks, Steve. Uh, my name is Steve Elliott. I'm the Program Vice President of Infrastructure and Operations and DevOps Research at IDC. And at IDC, uh, my team and I, we advise enterprise IT organizations across the observability and the various infrastructure and operations uh, topics. So, Chris, I'd love to hear more about you and your role, who you are, as well as what your company does. Hi. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you for uh, inviting me here today. My name is Christopher Younger. I'm the Senior Vice President of Freedom Financial Network. Uh, we do a number of debt relief solutions for the, the U.S. population. My job is uh, technical operations or technology operations. I handle our service desk, our infrastructure systems team with our engineers, as well as our SRE, our DevOps and site reliability engineering teams. And with all of that, I provide the observability, the monitoring, management, alerting, and overall escalation and incident management for Freedom Financial Networks. Eric, um, before we really jump in, I'd love to hear more about who you are, what your role is, and what your company does. And by the way, thanks for bringing Vegas to us here today. <laughs> You're welcome. Good to be here. I just wanted to start off by thanking Steve and others for the opportunity to speak today. and. Uh, and share my experiences and insights with this amazing tool in hopes that you guys can uh, benefit from the successes we've achieved. So my name is Eric Smith. I'm the Global CX Chief Architect at Aristocrat. Uh, my role at Aristocrat is to ensure that uh, our suite of products is designed and architected to the highest technical security and governance standards. Uh, my organization consists of senior level architects across the globe, offices in the US, India, Australia, and other locations. Uh, provides me with a very strong international representation and skill set from across multiple industries. Uh, although our focal industry is uh, is casino and entertainment industry, uh, Aristocrat is very well diversified and uh, has other areas in digital online gaming as well as many others. Um, so what are some of the key business objectives and goals of my organization at Aristocrat? Uh, I think one of our mottos says it all, uh, bringing joy to life through the power of play. Uh, we are an entertainment business and customer experience is key to our success. Uh, the very name of our division, CXS, stands for Customer Experience Solutions. So ensuring that that level of experience uh, is successful is what drives us to develop the software solutions that we have as part of our product suite. So with that, I hope that gives a little insight into my world at Aristocrat. Steve? Great. Well, let's kick off the first topic and set of questions uh, around digital transformation. Um, I mean, Eric, you and I met over a year ago when you were starting your journey with Apti, and now you've had to really kind of probably pivot with the pandemic um, and all that you've mentioned uh, in our discussions that there's been an accelerated pace and pressure for digital transformation. Um, and now you're moving from really using Apti in one area of your business as well as moving them out into the field. Um, so I'd really love to hear more about um, what's happening and, and how quite how, how what you're doing with your digital transformation process right now. Uh, yes, you're correct, Steve. Things have drastically changed over the past year, and it's hard to believe that it's been almost a year since the all these global changes started and the impact it's had on all of our, all of our business and industries, especially here in Vegas, as you mentioned. 
uh, the shutdown of all the casinos, you know, was unprecedented and uh, something I hope that we never have to see in our lifetimes again. Um, but with this change uh, in our business came changes to our customer needs. Uh, now more than ever, safety and social distancing play key roles in, the, in this new world. And so our software had to adapt. So new features and functionalities were needed uh, to be created to support the new way in which casinos are now required to operate. And our development teams and architects uh, were up to the task to, to provide those solutions. So finding these new capabilities in a short period of time and ensuring the level of quality uh, remained uh, our focus. And it was no smart, small task. Uh, our customer experience is still our focus and mandatory, uh, but we were able to take advantage of what was a terrible situation, that being the closure of all the casinos, to work directly with our customers and help do upgrades and updates uh, on floors that were shut down that would be very challenging to do under normal operating processes. Uh, so taking advantages of that, you know, kind of provided a little bit of a small light during a dark time, but standing by and supporting our customers uh, during this time was the right thing to do and proved uh, our commitment to them and to our in industry. Uh, and eventually the casinos were reopened. Uh, uh, but there were some key things during that time uh, that, that we benefited from uh, by using app dynamics. Uh, obviously, uh, not having a, an active production floor uh, kind of closed the window on some of the insights we needed uh, for full stack visibility. But by having app dynamics used in our development and test labs, we were able to see into that environment uh, and, and to uh, benefit from what that provided us. These tools in our development and test environment gave us insight into, into traditionally what was only available really in a live production floor, which was impossible during this time. So this proved to help us greatly and increased our level of quality uh, in time for the reopening of the casinos. Wow, that's amazing. I mean, that's great to hear the initiatives you had and the investments that you were making and what you were targeting. So wonderful. Um, I'm going to flip over to, to Chris uh, uh, over at Freedom Financial. And last time, you know, Chris, you and I caught up. Uh, you mentioned that Freedom also had to change during these these times of COVID and the pandemic. Uh, tell us why you're digitally transforming at Freedom and and what you're really focusing on to achieve right now. I'm glad you asked that, Stephen. It's um, you know, COVID has brought us a lot of challenges into. Um, how we do our business, how our staff um, relates to each other, um, most of which being sending us all home. So we're not in the office uh, spreading uh, COVID. But, um, you know, as far as digital transformation, um, I had a very unique challenge here. Um, I, I've done automation. I've done SRE work and DevOps before. But this is a very siloed operation we have here at Freedom. Uh, there's an engineering team that does our main development. Um, and then there's an IT team that takes care of all the systems in the company. Marrying those two together has been a, a challenge. And from the start, I knew I needed a tool that gives me the observability and the ability to tie pieces and parts from different teams all together. Um, FD, of course, rises right to the, to the top of that because it allows me to let teams integrate FD when and where they want. I don't have to go chase them down. I don't have to, you know, browbeat them about it. I say, look, here's the tool, implement it as you see fit. We'll be more than happy to help you. And then as we start gathering their metrics and start displaying for them all the things that they can do, which is, um, hey, are you, is your transaction slowing down? Is your database slow? As they start to see that and they realize that they don't have to use the arcane talents of open source tools to do it, um, we started to get a lot of traction um, to the point where recently, um, you know, we were screwing around with one of our dev controllers and uh, some some team had written something very specific on the dev, to, dev controller for AppD. And we took it down because we were doing some integrations on it and they called us up at 6.30 in the morning. Oh my God, where did my dashboard go? I depend on that. <laughs> and, you know, we had to have a conversation about change control and, you know, what goes in production. But um, it showed me that we're on the right path. Um, the teams really want those metrics. They want the data, they want the dashboards. And more importantly, um, now that we're so spread out, we can't just pull people into a meeting. It's easier to just send them a link to a dashboard and say, do you see what I see? And that's been a very, very important differentiator in, in you know, going from an open source set of tools to AppD, which you know brings it all together under one house. Um, 
so that's basically, you know, the challenge that I have and, and the change in our environment where we all, we used to be very manual. You used to pull each other into meetings. Now we use kind of app to use almost a conversational tool about the performance of an application. So that's what I've got for you. All right, I'm going off script, Chris. Any any war stories? You did you kind of shared one there, but to pre protect the names of the innocent, any other good war stories you got to share about that type of thing? I always love war stories from customers. It's a pretty straightforward. I mean, um, so we had we had the dashboards going down. So we we have another um, custom in-house uh, software. Basically, we're developing some of our own call center software. Um, and one of the things that gets very interesting for us is we're tying in elements from both IT, um, our telephony group, our de our engineering development groups, as well as a bunch of you know offsite cloud based you know operations. So from our standpoint, who's at fault? That's always the issue. Is now we have a P one situations you know really screwed up. Who's at fault? What's going on? What are we focus? And without you know naming the names you know it's very easy to point at well this looks like a SaaS problem this looks like an internal problem this is a network problem it, it gets very easy to drill down and the names that i think i can mention for you guys is we also deploy CWAM, the uh the cisco workload optimization manager which ties into apt it lets us drill down a little further into our virtual stack so we can see Oh, there was a V motion that occurred that caused this application to twitch that caused this app, this application to, you know, go down because we never expected that to happen. So, um, you know, the war stories are, are they're new because I'm a new customer, but we are already seeing the return and benefits in, in having the entire stack of uh, app dynamics products. Great. So let's move on to the next topic of, of challenges and uh, I'm going to throw this question to you, Stephen. Uh, at IDC, you know, you, you, you advise a lot of clients and you take them down their journeys. Um, how do Eric and Chris's organizations compare to, to what your clients face as kind of a, the first part of the question? And then if you could share any, you know, pitfalls organizations see as they digitally transform, I'd love to hear that from your perspective and IDC's perspective. Sure. Yeah, no, it's, it's a fascinating question. Um, I think we'll, you know, start with some of the challenges and Certainly, Chris and Eric, um, uh, there are very common challenges in, you know, customers we're advising. In fact, you know, there's a couple things that really stand out. Uh, first and foremost, the complexity, you know, increasing complexity of application and infrastructure architectures. Um, you know, multi-cloud environments is just driving more and more uh, challenges to observability and performance. On top of that, organizational challenges. We're seeing um, organizations really think about DevOps, uh, site reliability engineering, infrastructure platform engineering, automation, um, the role of observability uh, and software reliability and system reliability. So you know, this whole notion of how can we identify, resolve, and potentially predict the problem faster than we ever could before with the right people getting access to a single repository of information. Uh, and then finally, the third piece in terms of, you know, I guess pitfalls are you know, making sure that the, the processes are in place so that when you have the right level of data, the right viewpoint from an end-to-end -end standpoint, that you also have the right processes and people in place so you can drive you know, the fastest optimized you know, process for identification resolution of, you know, for any service uh, faster than ever before. So we're seeing a, a number of things where leadership teams are recognizing the importance of not just you know, having the right tools in place, but really making sure that, that the collaboration is enabled, that the commitment to excellence, and an understanding of, well, why are we doing this? Which maybe is one of the pitfalls, you know, identifying what the business key performance indicators really are. And, and not waiting Till the end of a project or the end of a business case, you really have that front and center. And often, you know, another pitfall we, we identified with many customers, in fact, I was advising a large auto manufacturing customer about a week ago, identification of not just the business KPIs, but who's the customer? You know, who, who are you really trying to serve and how do they value certain business metrics? 
because frankly, it, it's different for every type of customer, you know, whether it's an internal customer or an external customer and identifying really clean, really crisp, what the, the key performance indicators are from a business standpoint. You know, another recent customer conversation, we were talking about KPIs and for observability particularly, and they said, well, you know, we look at deployment frequency and code error rates and, you know, lead time for changes. And they said, well, that's great. Technically, you're spot on. But what are the business KPIs that those support? And that led to a long discussion about, well, you know, who's the customer? What do they value? You know, is it really about cost reduction? Is it more about time to market? Is it more about customer satisfaction, net promoter score? So it, it really, you know, I would say one of the big pitfalls is, you know, make sure that you're identifying not just the technical KPIs, but what do they mean to the business KPIs and to that end customer, regardless of if that customer is internal or external. Chris or Eric, does any of that, uh, you know, feed back into your worlds and any thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I think so. I think that's a great question. And, and, you know, as we're talking about this full stack visibility, it's even more, uh, even more important today as, as what was mentioned before, because of the complexity and scale of the systems. I mean, the demands on these systems continue to grow and, and expand and our visibility into all levels is, is absolutely critical. I'll give you an example. A casino operation uh, is open 24-7. There's no room for downtime. So every minute an operator's floor is down equates to lost revenue. And that can literally be millions of dollars if that floor is down for an extended period of time. Uh, and it also has an impact on the customer uh, experience. Uh, customers have options. You know, if they walk into a place and the floor is down, uh, they take their cash, they walk to your competitor next door. So it's very, very uh, critical that I have full uh, insight to uh, everything that's going on there so that we can try to remedy and reduce any of that downtime. Uh, I, I, I starts with development, uh, really, and that's why we've embedded into our development DNA uh, app dynamics so that we can grab uh, a hold of any of those challenges, have full insight of the full stack, uh, fix them in a test and development environment long before they hit a, a production floor. So not only is app dynamics critical to our production observability, uh, but also in our development process as well. And that gives us the ability to do baselining and trend analysis and proactively alert when threshold variances have changed and so much so much more that it's more than, than just a, a tool. It really is, as I mentioned before, kind of ingrained into the DNA of how we develop software. Well, right, Eric, I'm really jealous of the fact that you guys are already doing baselining and, and performance increases in development. Um, I miss that. My, my last position, uh, we had that going, very mature team, very spot on with little changes of the dial, tweaking the application. We're still very young in that process here at Freedom. And, um, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, when you look at those KPI, uh, KPIs, um, Steve had it very, very uh, spot on is pay attention to the KPI because our development teams, they want to be agile. They want to focus on speed of delivery and you know we can release it well and all that kind of stuff and i can tell you from my last position we achieved a release at will we would do 10 12 you know 20 releases in a day and after about a year of that you know we all sat back at a leadership meeting one day and we said but how is the business doing well revenues had actually dropped you know we actually hadn't accomplished the business goals that we wanted even though we achieved release at will so a little bit of a culture discussion and it's spot on. So at Freedom, the team is pretty mature and the leadership team is very uh, aware of this type of uh, issue. So we focus exactly on the things that we need to. We basically run a call center at the end of the day. So how effective are our agents? What's their close rates? You know, are they getting enough leads that they can work during the day? All of our technology solutions go to that goal. And if the business redirects us into, you know what, leads are no longer the issue, now we need more ads served. Those are all things that we tackle from a technology standpoint. And I'm looking forward to the day where in development, we can have AppD, you know, watch that for us so that they can actually do A and B testing live. So by the time it goes to production, they already know it's going to work. So, you know, that's, a goal that I, I really hope to maintain, hope to achieve. And uh, like I said, I get I get jealous when, uh, you know, Eric talks because I go, I want to be there. So that's that's the goal that I'm striving for. 
Great. Well, let's move on to the next kind of topic that I want to talk about, which is, you know, full stack observability and really how business awareness kind of melds with that as a solution, the challenges that we just kind of were, were tossing around. So first, I'm going to toss it to Eric. Um, you mentioned that you've been dealing with like complex IT estates uh, to me in the past and an overwhelmingly amount of data. And, you know, I'd love to hear more about, you know, how how full stack observability, because we've been hearing it a lot across the industry, is linked to you and how you're implementing it um, and why it's critical for you to have visibility into things outside of just the application, things like the infrastructure, network, and security. So I'd love to hear your perspective on how you're how you're doing that full stack observability. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. That's that's a great question. Uh, I think some of it's been talked about by everybody here on on the panel, and and uh, it's amazing the similarities and the crossover uh, of needs and 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 what this tool provides to each of us. Uh, um, so, as I mentioned before, our, our customer experience is is number one uh, priority. That's our focus to make sure that our software provides that best customer experience. It's all about the uh, the experience and the level. Uh, uh, that that experience leaves uh, leaves a lasting impression, good or bad. So, so to understand the customer and how we interact with our products is essential. You'll you'll hear terms in our industry like uh, card in, card out, play session, and many others. These are key transactional points of a customer's experience. So, let me give you an example. A customer walks into an establishment and sits in front of a slot machine to begin an entertainment experience. So, several things are about to happen. Okay, one. The customer may use their card to card into the slot machine. This allows them to build up, you know, loyalty points, receive promotions, and many other experiences and events. And when they begin that experience, uh, uh, there's there's so much more going on in the back end. Uh, the, when they card in, we now understand who they are and have insight into their history of play. Uh, what types of promotions are they qualified for? What's their balance of loyalty rewards? So much that's going on. Uh, and it's all driven uh, by our suite of products. So you can start to see how the visibility and how into how the system is doing from a full stack perspective is key. It's not it's not just looking to see if the services are running. It's not just to see is the database online. Okay, the, there's lots of tools out there that can tell me is my CPU running hot or my RAM I'm maxing out and so forth. It's really the ability to see into the full life cycle of a customer's experience and walk that transaction path. Uh, within the system uh, so that we can really understand how to better provide that customer experience to them. And with AppDynamics there, it, it, it's it's a game changer. This is, you know, this is a level of partnership with my architects and developers by using it uh, in development and in production to see the full picture, not just peeking into windows of information. Follow that transaction from beginning to end. Understand the experience to be able to improve the experience. And again, I keep saying it, and I keep saying this to my development teams, it is part of our DNA of software development and a valuable tool in our tool belt. Chris, um, how does having deep visibility into the stack and having that business awareness uh, enable you to really achieve your business objectives and your business goals? Well, Steve, I, mean, I can tell you the full stack, you know, is the goal. Um, I've specialized um, in the past at least 10 years on taking everything from the data center, the cloud, all the way up into the application stack and, and observing it and really getting my hands around it. Um, and I mentioned before that I do use the other component, uh, CWAM. So it, it lets me drill down all the way down into my virtual systems, the storage that they're attached to, the network that they're running on. And for me, you know, since we're still young, there's a lot of firefighting, you know, there's, there's fire extinguishers everywhere, as I, need, as, I, as I put it, and most of my team is in that mode. So it allows us to focus uh, when we have an incident, you know, because the problem is we're still at that mode of reactions. So we're down, what happened? If I can drill all the way down to my storage layer quickly um, and have that alerted, you know, and, and presented into AppD as a dashboard, it makes it go a lot faster for us. And, and you know, from that, 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 that full stack visibility and whether it's on-prem, whether it's in the cloud, um, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, we look at, like I said, you know, when you, when you take in the intake from where we are, um, it's all a phone call generally as people are either calling into our systems or we're calling them. 
Um, however that event starts, you know, from the time that we're interacting with that customer, we have a very short window to close, right? So it, it's a, you know, all hands on deck, if you will, but not really, because everybody's out doing other things. So we need to make sure that when we deploy AppD and the way it's integrated into our applications, that AppD is our all hands on deck, that it lets us know through the agents, through the cluster agents, through the cloud agents, they let us know if there's any twitches that we should be aware of because all of our systems are very, very sensitive. They haven't been tuned. So for me, what, you know, the full stack view is extremely important um, because, you know, we're not at that point where we're fully optimizing. It's, I need to see everything. And it's a little bit of information overload, but again, AppD helps with that where I can filter out via dashboard, via the metrics I'm displaying, what gets presented. And I can have a highly technical view for the technical teams that need to know these things. And I can give the product managers a different view, which is basically, is this app working or not? We changed a feature. Is that feature helping or hurting? As opposed to the raw stats of, well, you know, we're, you know, a couple hundred milliseconds of, uh, you know, increased uh, query time. So it's a little simplified, you know, I, it's a good thing. I don't have to go deep into the details on, on everything, but for us, it's a, it's a canary in the coal mine. It's a, you know, it lets us start, um, start an incident further down the road, as opposed to just everybody runs around and looks for the fire. Yeah, I always kind of like the analogy. It used to be a needle in the haystack to find a problem with technology and it's moved to be more of a needle in a needle stack and having the right tools and perspective on that, I think is like you were mentioning with your examples, it's just, it's great to have. And it's great to hear your stories on that and your details. Great, so we're gonna move into almost a, a double click into what I think full stack observability is into the business context. So uh, Stephen from IDC, I'm gonna throw this first question to you. It's clear, you know, that with the increasing technology initiatives out there and they're intertwined with the broader business, you know, initiatives and goals, um, what's the role of full stack observability with that business context uh, that can play not just a technological advantage, but also help businesses achieve success? Yeah, no, it's a great question because it's so important now for the audience and, and for everyone in technology, but, but even more so because business executives, particularly over the past year with the pandemic, have been forced to really think about and answer the question, is their business architecture, in fact, their technology architecture? And when you think about the past year and moving forward this year, customer engagement models have changed. Um, business models have changed almost literally overnight. In fact, a couple of companies we've advised, they've had to rethink their entire revenue model in terms of, wow. for example, you know, in one case, there's a very large supply chain company that was supplying uh, many universities uh, with their food sources. Well, when students don't go to school, they no longer need those supplies. But yet this company had to rethink how can they get a net new customer, let's say consumers like us, uh, goods that we need, you know, whether it's toilet paper, eggs, chicken, you know, things that were in high demand, paper towels. Uh, early in the pandemic. So imagine trying to reshape the the lens of who your customer is and then getting that level of, of food and, and goods to a whole new set of consumer base, uh, in this case via e-commerce and in fact with visits to uh, warehouse sites with you know essentially touchless delivery, putting things into trunks of cars. And that's, that's a, a great example of you know, you think about the need for observability and how these techno you know, business architectures are the technology architectures. And every customer, regardless of their internal or external, we don't have a lot of patience with poorly performing services. Um, we want a great experience. And so we're finding more and more of the C-suite, particularly business savvy executives realizing, well, not only do I need this level of, of business assurance, Right and risk mitigation, but I also have to make sure that you know the processes are in place, that the technology that we have the right teams and organizational constructs. I mean, let's face it, most organizations on the phone, certainly Eric and Christopher, 
have adopted agile you know to various levels and, and workloads are going through those agile development processes and then certainly many companies have have adopted multiple types of clouds and have all kinds of different application architectures you know classic architectures container based architectures even some serverless so we're finding that not just the complexity i think eric mentioned it a few minutes ago complexity has skyrocketed but so has particularly with the pandemic the pressure on business executives to really understand the technology implications for their success and for the the business kpis that they're paid to deliver frankly and so you know just having a recent conversation with the cio of a large supply chain company and she said you know i can't believe how many business conversations not just she was having but her directs were having across the hr across the financial group and across the the product owners to really a recognition and a maturity on the part of the business functions to realize how much they need the technology investments and the investments in, in, in the people that are driving the projects, but how much they rely on the success of those projects to essentially provide resiliency in this case for the changes that that company had to go through last year and continuing to transform this year. So, you know, the very foundation of a lot of these conversations is availability um, or system reliability. You know, if you're an SRE, it's, it's all about reliability. Um, and so we're finding that, you know, it's just a, a great opportunity to have the have observability as a, certainly a foundational point for many of these conversations. And then to recognize that the business KPIs that have to be delivered and the resiliency now for successful business organizations a lot of this resides on on the, the opportunity or the requirement, I should say, for collecting tremendous amounts of data across these products and services, and then the ability to share the information, provide the access across different teams that's driving more and more collaboration. Because ultimately, you know, we all want a great experience, regardless of, of how we define who the customer is. But we also want to make sure that that you know, if there's a problem, and problems always always come up. That we can we can either prevent it you know, down the road, or at least find it, identify it quickly, faster than ever before, get the right people on it, and then go resolve it. And, and I think those are our resiliency themes that we're going to continue to see, not just last year that really accelerated, but certainly moving forward. Yeah, it, it just resonates with me how IT teams and professionals and leadership teams in IT now really have had to internalize the business metrics on top of the technology. Uh, it's more important ever than it has before and being able to react to those metrics like you described. Uh, extremely helpful. Thank you, Stephen. So I'm going to throw a question to you, Chris, in, in a similar vein, uh, the need for business context. Uh, what are the business KPIs um, that matter most to Freedom Financial and in your world to support the business from a technology perspective? Well, I'll tell you, Steve, the, the main thing that's important to us, and, and before I answer that, I'll, I'll take one little step back here and explain our infrastructure a little bit. So even though we do have to focus on our end customer, which signs deals with us and we absolve debt, um, our customer, my internal customer, is actually our call center agent. Uh, we sent 1,600 people home uh, during COVID. They're still home. So they had to work as effectively as a call center agent um, at home as they do in the office. So this is a pretty significant amount of technology and I won't get into the details, but it basically boils down to a browser interaction um, that every call center agent has and how they do their job. So one of the things I'm looking forward to deploying with AppD is that browser agent um, that helps me determine how effective our call center agents are because all the tools they're using are web-based and they're being used through a Chrome browser. So I need to be able to tell exactly what they're doing, um, how effective it is, get those metrics back. Because when you start talking about KPIs, we have KPIs that start with, well, we have a number of leads and those leads are converted, but it also gets down to how many calls are agents making? Are those calls effective? So we do things like we are actually trapping all of the, uh, we're translating and, tra and um, transliterating the calls so that we hear the words on both sides. 
we can actually tell if an agent is talking to somebody who's emotionally distressed. So the effectiveness of the agent is, is very important and it's one of the most, the biggest KPIs. And it, it was interesting. I was just in a meeting the other day with one of my engineering partners where they were laughing about the fact that we're used to adjusting our sliders and our needles and knobs to get big percentage changes, you know, so did, did we generate more leads? Did we close more leads? The business operations teams are looking for fractions of percentages, you know, the, you know, can an agent close 0.2 more percent, right? And, and how can they do that? Can they use different language? So they're analyzing things like words and text. Now this all boils down into a KPI of effective agent, right? Um, leads in, leads out, close rates. Um, we also have something called negotiations. So once we understand somebody's full debt load, um, how can we negotiate that better for them? And what's the appropriate method to pay for it? So those are all business level KPIs that we as technologists have to take and say, how can we help? Um, we have a specialized algorithm that, that looks at debt. We have another algorithm that looks at negotiations and our likelihood of closing. Um, how do we help in all that? And, and all the things that go behind that are the data teams, um, our other um, product teams that are designing products around these services that we can either resell or use internally. All of those things are plugged in or will be plugged into AppD shortly so that as those little sliders get you know, changed, how fast can we generate these, um, these new solutions, right? So um, when you ask me about, you know, the KPIs and, you know, we've talked about full stack and everything, it, it's all integrated at the Freedom. Um, and, and what's really important is our, our leadership, very plugged into this, um, you know, all the way up to our owners. Um, they ask very thoughtful questions. You know, um, one of the most important things that we discuss on our uh, sprint meetings is, uh, because he's there, is uh, what are the outcomes? Are the outcomes based? Don't just tell me that you, you checked off seven boxes. What did those seven boxes do for the bottom line? What did they do for the customer? What did they do for the company? So um, that's how important it is to us. And it's very important for us to drill down into things. And, and you know, even to bring something that um, uh, Stephen Elliott said earlier, um, we had a little internal thing that we had to do too. Well, you know, we have a cafeteria in our office that clearly is not in use anymore. Uh, we contracted services to do this for us. They pivoted to assist with when we distribute and collect in, um, our hardware um, for people onboarding and offboarding at the company. They also put together, um, you know, meals for our families, our internal families that are in need. They also help with the um, we're in Tempe, Arizona, so we help with uh, families in Tempe, Arizona during this whole COVID, um, you know, shutdown as well. So, you know, everybody had to make a pivot, and that was one of those things that we adopted as a business model, even though it has nothing to do really with technology. Um, we all had to pivot and start looking at well, how do we more effectively use this service so that they stay employed and, you know, don't lose their jobs and how do they help us? And, and that was one of the things that we ended up doing as well. So it, it, it's all, it's an all hands on deck effort, but we are backed up by our owners to think outside of the box and care for everyone. That's absolutely what we do. Wow. 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 Well, that's, all, that's, that's a very interesting in, in details. I love it. Awesome. Well, I'm going to move over to Eric on the same type of question. Um, around KPIs and, and the business context. Uh, how is the business context for you, Eric, deep into the stack, uh, able to help you and where you sit in your business? No, an, another great question. And, and again, uh, listening to the, uh, the comments by other panel members, there's a lot of similarities and crossover there, uh, even though they're in different industries. So as I, as I talked about a little bit earlier before, um, you know, customer experience is, is the focus. And I think it's, it's important to understand that you know, who is the customer? I think that there are kind of primarily three layers of customer for us that we focus our, our, our uh, experience efforts on. One is uh, the, the casino operator. You know, they're a customer of ours and making sure that our suite of products helps them achieve their goals to manage and run their, uh, their, their casino uh, and work and interact through gateways and so forth with other vendors uh, is, is one customer. Uh, the employee of the operator is another customer, making sure that the tools that are part of our suite 
uh, that help them facilitate uh, the operations of the casino and their job on a day-to-day -day basis is another customer that we look at and target in that customer experience. And then, of course, the patron, the customer that comes in uh, looking for the entertainment experience, and all of those kind of work together, and the software uh, that we develop has to make sure that we target the experience at all of those levels. Any breakdown in any one of those levels can have a negative experience that as I alluded to before, which is, is is not the target and not what people want to have occur. Um, so how app dynamics helps that again, back to what I've talked about before and that full stack visibility is is to be able to isolate those customer transaction flow, flows or paths uh, to identify things uh, like speed of response, uh, nines of uptime, uh, all these types of things that you hear uh, from a technology uh, side of the house that require uh, some visibility to understand what's going on. Again, to, to repeat myself, it's not just that the, the CPU is running higher, the RAM is uh, you know maxing out or, or, or you're running out of I, uh, IO storage. It's, it's understanding that entire customer transaction path. And that's what we get with the dashboards and the views in, in, into our application. Um, and that helps us understand that you know, what we may have traditionally anticipated and developed our software to do is not necessarily reflective of the path that the customer is taking or the path that the employee is using on a day-to-day -day basis. Sometimes you find that concepts in, uh, on the table and then develop uh, don't actually hit the mark once you see them in operation. Um, but that this is what it gives us an ability to see uh, in addition to all the other capabilities that we have. So very, very strong, valuable tool uh, that, that helps both in a production environment as well as our development process to, to achieve that customer, again, all three levels of customer, customer experience. Well, I'm going to transition into our, our wrap up and we're going to do a, a little bit something different. I'm going to do a lightning round today to get some, some insight. So great, great feedback today from all of our panelists. And uh, um, I really wanted to toss this first lightning round question to Eric. And uh, working for Aristocrat and all of the changes that have happened uh, last year with the pandemic, uh, what's something that you love about your job or your team or your company? And then the second part of that is what makes you proud of what you are doing? Oh, thank you for that question, because uh, any time that I can uh, share with people uh, the wonderful, amazing company that I work for, I love to take those opportunities. So thank you. Uh, you know, Aristocrat is an amazing company. Uh, and I think I knew that going into this this past year with the challenges that we faced, but it, it became even more apparent as we lived through uh, 2020 together. I mean, world changing events, uh, when they started happening, Aristocrat stepped up to the plate very early on and started the ball rolling on our globalization work from home initiative, you know, trying to globalize the, uh, the number of people that we have to transition from offices into homework, uh, into, into working from home uh, is a logistical challenge, but Aristocrat did it amazingly. It's not only just lifting and shifting, if you will, people to work from office into the home, but you take a look at the, some of the equipment challenges that we faced. I mean, we've got uh, software that obviously interacts with uh, EGM gaming machines. Those machines are not accessible when you move home. Trying to get those uh, logistics coordinated to get some of those physical machines home to the uh, to the developers so they could continue to develop uh, was a challenge. But Aristocrat did a phenomenal job, and literally in a matter of days, uh, we we were globalized and working from home. And, and honestly, I think that the level and quality of the people uh, that we have within the company shined as well during this time. Uh, the productivity, uh, you, could, you could anticipate that by going through something like this, that productivity would take a dip. It did not. If anything, I believe our productivity increased and people collaborated more. Uh, I think people are sick of Zoom, <laughs> but it, it did give us a uh, the ability to increase our productivity, which was fantastic. And and then also the other things that the Aristocrat did during this time that were amazing were some of the programs that they put into place to to help uh, all of our team members, uh, both financially if needed and mentally if needed. Uh, one of the things that uh, that we implemented early on was what we've uh, affectionately called our Wellness Friday. 
Uh, it's been part of our culture now since uh, since this all started, and that that what that does is it gives the opportunity for our employees to to block out the second half of a Friday to take that time to recuperate, to recharge the batteries, maybe to catch up on on uninterrupted time that uh, they didn't have during the week. Again, a focus on the health and well being of the employee and team members uh, is, has been a focus of Aristocrat and continues even to this day. It's not something that was reactionary that. It only lasted for the first month or two. It is now part of our culture. Uh, so, and I don't mean it to sound like a cliche, but it's it's a fantastic and wonderful place to work. The the people are amazing. I take pride in when I uh, before COVID, when I was able to travel to our domestic and international offices and meet with the team members uh, and get to know them. Uh, amazing people across all the different cultures that we have in our company. So. Like I said, I could go on and on and on about what a wonderful company it is, uh, and, and, and it has been proven time and time again, especially over the challenges that we've had this last year. Uh, and, it, and it really speaks well for not only the company in general, but the, the, te the team members and the people that are spread out through all of Aristocrat. Oh, that's great. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Um, and Chris, similar question. Um, how about you at, at Freedom Financial? It's been an interesting year. Um, what's something that you love about your job or your team or your company and what makes you proud uh, of what you're doing? Well, Steve, you know, I'll tell you, you know, I, I came to Freedom because of the company's culture. Um, you know, they're very, very into the employees uh, being empowered doing their jobs. Um, like I said, one of our core values is care for everyone, right? Um, when COVID hit, and, and I tell you, it really, the money, the, the company had to put its money where its mouth was. Um, we were not set up for work from home. In fact, the standing orders were telecommuting is kind of verboten. Um, you know, and instantly, you know, I was flying back and forth. I was actually supposed to relocate as part of my job. Well, as soon as COVID kind of happened, you know, they said, look, uh, you need to figure out how to get all 2,500 people at home, including the call center. And I was like, wow, okay, that's what they pay me for. So, you know, we spent a lot of money, ordered a lot of equipment, uh, leaned on our vendors pretty heavily, but within two weeks time, uh, we had an organized method of um, minimal amount of people coming in at structured times to get their equipment. Um, we had video training to, here's how you set up your equipment at home, and we sent everybody home. And they work pretty much exactly like they work in the office. Um, we took we took a little more of a, a bat a bat to the the head approach on it and said you know Tuesdays and Thursdays we block out um, the middle of the day uh, and you're not allowed to have uh, meetings uh, scheduled at least with inside the company so um, because that was something where even our owner came to the fact that he's like I'm tired I know you're all tired so you know it's just that that way that we react. Now, that's something inside the company. And that was, again, like I said, why I came to Freedom. We're, we're very good with our own staff. But I tell you, the other thing that we get is a lot of testimonials from our customers themselves. Uh, remember, we're helping people um, negotiate and absolve a significant amount of, of financial debt. And, you know, we actually are not, uh, we can't engage unless there's a specific issue you know, medical, death in the family, you know, uh, bankruptcy, I mean, big, huge events. So we're dealing with people at a very, very troubling and, and vulnerable time for them. But we get testimonials of just, hey, you know, uh, your loan, you know, loan consultant, talk to us about, you know, what we can do. Your debt consultants walked us through, you know, how to repair and how to get back on track with our financial um, situation. And when you look at how many customers, I mean, just hundreds of millions of customers ever that we've helped, you know, and it used to be an uphill, uphill battle because the banks don't really want to deal with people like us because we're getting in between them and their customers. Fast forward to now, where now you have large banks, I mean, the big banks, not like little moms and pops here and there that are coming to us and saying, you guys interact with our customers in a way that we don't interact with them and that we're not capable of interacting with them. You're actually helping them be back, become part of the financial community again. So now they're starting to come on board with, hey, you know, let us look at how you guys do what you do. So we take them behind the kimono and we show them, you know, here's the technology that we have at play. So it becomes very important for when we say we're using something like AppD, 
that's a very important you know keystone that we say look our technology is solid you're trusting us with your customers and your data um, we're watching every single aspect of it and we can tell when we have problems so you know what we did i mean is quite amazing i mean from from my standpoint i mean i thought this was just going to be a technical job and here we are really helping people's lives and working with both the end customer and these large banks that normally would not want to work with us so that's how it changed for us and that's you know it makes me very proud to be part of that system and to have an impact in a very large way about how we do that type of business wow that's great thanks chris and then uh steven i'm gonna switch it up on you just a little bit but really wanted to uh you know, you, you, you and the IDC team work with so many different, you know, clients of all sizes and all industries. I'd uh, love to hear your advice and or guidance on, um, you know, what you want to give to the group here as they navigate into their digital journeys or through their digital journeys. Yeah, no, thank you. I mean, I think there's, there's a couple things that uh, we advise on, you know, particularly as it relates to uh, business observability, KPIs, um, planning process, et cetera. You know, first and foremost, um, a little bit of a cliche, but having the right leadership and the right teammates. You know, clearly uh, we're in a, a rising complexity environment. Um, everything has essentially become digital, and these technology architectures are, are really at the heart and foundation of of almost every business. So, you know, the importance of having end to end visibility having you know, the ability to have great dashboards, access to those dashboards across multiple teams, and then understanding what the right analytics are and, and how they can drive faster resolution times, higher team productivity, and, and even better customer service and experiences. You know, really think about these in terms of the use case that you build, um, in terms of communications with various leadership teams, and make sure you know, as, as Chris and Eric were talking, I really thought about, you know, everybody, historically, we talk about metrics that matter. And now it's really, you know, KPIs that matter. And, you know, all of us, we've talked about KPIs, but, but it's even more important now more than ever, choose the right ones, right? And, and the, the baseline really starts with, well, who is the customer and what do they value, right? And, and it's very important because that, that notion of value changes. Some people like speed, time to market. Others like net promoter score increases. Others like revenues and profits, right? So there's no shortage of, of you know, the discussion points we've had today, but really hone in on the ones that, that fit for you. Um, I would say the final point is that, you know, it's just as important to have the right technology and the right people, of course, but, you know, organizational structure increasingly matters more and more. And identifying, you know, what type of structure, who are the folks you need to get involved in the conversations? I was uh, advising a, a client in the financial services industry, and we were sort of walking through the transformation of their uh, infrastructure operations teams, particularly the IT operations team. And this leader said, you know, I've got to work with my DevOps. I've got to work with infrastructure platform engineers. I've got to work with my cloud COEs. Now I've got to work with application development teams. And then of course we have an emerging SRE practice. <laughs> and, and it was great because it really, you know, for his team, it really set the stage for not only do we have to collaborate, but let's identify the key stakeholders so that they can deliver, in this case, we're talking about observability capabilities and, and what those, you know, how they were going to define um, what they needed and you know how the other customer constituents were going to absorb and be part of the process. Um, so you know those are things. It's when you set this up, and and you know planning is so important for success. Um, and I think these are some of the key um, success factors that we're finding for companies that successfully uh, deploy observability. Great, thanks, Stephen. That's great advice and guidance. Uh, really appreciate that and. You know, I have to say, this has been a great panel. It's been a great discussion today. And I really want to thank all the panelists today for, for really sharing your experiences and your insights. So um, I just want to do a quick reminder. 
for everybody in our audience, and thank you for joining us today. Join my colleagues for deep dive uh, breakout sessions that are going to be uh, after this session, as well as check out the Expo Hall for live events with AppD experts and visit our partner booths also. So the last thing I'll say is stick around for the closing performance by Common. It'll be a really fun one. I know I'm going to have a little beverage open for that. And, you know, I want to also add, you know, being a past customer of both AppDynamics and Cisco, we're your partner. We're there for you no matter where you are in the digital journey, um, digital transformation. We're there to help you and just give us a ring. We'll be happy to, to help you and do what we can to get you down that path and make your business successful. Thanks again. Many lack the mobility or the flexibility to reach critical urban appointments. The remedy, it turns out, is as much a technological marvel as it is a medical one. Meet Metabus, a state-of-the-art clinic on four wheels. But designing such a wonder came with its own set of challenges, taking everything Cisco knows about mobility, connectivity, video conferencing and security into account and, together with partner Deutsche Bahn, dispatching it from the cloud to create a 21st century lifeline. Now, no area is too remote. No diagnosis or specialist unavailable. All because one company dared to wonder if the road to better healthcare could literally be the road that runs through town. That's the inclusive future. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome everyone to the marriage between Rebecca and Cameron. In the presence of this company, it gives me great pleasure to declare you are now legally husband and wife. Cameron, you may now kiss the bride. Between being there and being together, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Uh, my name is Imran Razak. I've uh, been with Cisco for about five years, and I lead a team 